Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlin. Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I'm Tim Erlin, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire. And today I'm joined by Emil Saig, President and CEO of Entirety, uh, also a cloud visionary and one of the fathers of OpenStack. I think you can put quotes around that last phrase there. And today, um, Emil and I are going to talk a little bit about uh, the issue of authenticity, identity, and and we'll just say, and the internet. So, um, Emil, before we sort of dive into the details here, can you um, can you just sort of frame up the problem for the audience, why we're having this conversation? Absolutely, and thank you so much for having me on uh, your show. It's a it's an honor. Um, so, there are multiple. Um, instances where lack of authenticity has uh, driven a frenzy out there. Um, and uh, that could be um, cybersecurity threats in um, in enterprise or could be in things that are very popular like the game stock, uh, stock out there and AMC lately and so on and so forth where you've had a frenzy of basically bots in the social media arena um, that are driving hype uh, around a certain aspect um, of a financial vehicle. Um, this has also, as you recall, uh, has uh, allegedly happened during the elections uh, in two cycles now. And there's continued threats of, you know, a lot of these anonymous um, bots and, and an anonymous personas out there um, that are driving um, uh, effects that are uh, uh, that are potentially not real. I think we could probably stand to, I don't know, do a little bit of term definition here as we talk through this, because I think there are a couple of layers of problem there. So, um, you know, we're talking about, um, let's just say, accounts for different platforms. And there's the need to determine that behind that account is a real person. And if it's not a real person, you'd consider that a bot. Is that a, a reasonable way to think about it? Correct. Exactly. And then that real person obviously has an identity. And so there's also the the potential that that account is anonymous. In other words, you can't verify who the person is behind that account. That would be sort of the anonymity aspect of it. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So am I, am I missing something there? Is, are there any other definitions that, that we need to understand as part of this conversation? No, I think, I think that's a, that's great grounding. Um, whereas there's really, not uh, a, a major problem with anonymity, um, right? Um, where um, you need to kind of retain your um, your identity um, secret from the intended audience. Um, there is a problem when you're creating multiple of these um, uh, identities out there um, in an anonymous fashion and mm-hmm. uh, and essentially driving a sentiment. Um, that is not real, um, and uh, by owning a lot of these anonymous "quote unquote" personas. So, is the is the problem behind there that a single person or a single, even a, I guess a single entity might be a way to think about it, is able to to multiply their influence by creating multiple identities, whether they're bots or or you know a single person creating multiple uh, personas. I guess it's equivalent. You know, it's a matter of scale. Is that really the sort of the core of the problem that we're talking about? That's the core of the problem that we're talking about, um, because you know that uh, um, whenever you're in a conversation online, uh, you know you don't know who's behind that Twitter account. Um, is it a bot? Is it a real person? Um, is it one person that's running multiple accounts that are you know ganging up on you? Mm-hmm. Um, same thing, you know, with uh, product reviews. Uh, uh, same thing with uh, business reviews, so on and so forth. Out there, I mean, there's a there's a plethora of um, these services to hire um, that will, you know, actually uh, crank up reviews for a product or a service out there, right? And uh, and a lot of those things are driven by by um, by bot activity and uh, and in um, I would say uh, insincere users of the platforms. 
Yeah, so I, I wanted to touch on on sort of what the if we just call these, you know, broadly speaking, let's call them inauthentic identities, unless you want to suggest a, a better term, feel free. Um, wh what are sort of the the impacts? We touched on a couple of them, but uh, or we touched on a couple of the maybe the the consequences, but there's there's also impact. Like, what's the the negative outcome that that's really a problem here? Sure, I mean it ranges from narrative shaping, uh, market manipulation, as we saw with. Uh, GameStop uh, and AMC stock as of other stocks as well. Uh, cyber criminal activity, you know, fraud. Uh, and then in the case of elections, uh, economic and political influence, frankly. Um, so, um, and, and it, you know, very, I mean, it all kind of goes down to um, narrative shaping. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That ability to sort of, uh, you know, provide a, an outsized, uh, level of influence for a particular narrative um, through that sort of multiplication of of identity. It, it's a it's. I mean, as we talk through it, it, it's a big problem. This is not a this is not a small problem. It's a big problem, and you know, extends to to impacting uh, the economy and impacting you know the political climate as well. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, this is this is a um, existential threat. I think to the authenticity of the discourse in social media, right? Because at, at some point, you don't know whether you're talking to a real person or not. And you don't know um, if you're being upvoted or downvoted by real people or is this somebody that's trying to kind of shape the narrative, right? And that's mm. that's the risk and that's kind of the, the appeal um, is that let's kind of, you know, figure that out, you know, very quickly before it gets out of hand, further out of hand, I should say. Um, and... Um, and, you know, essentially limit. The technology exists, the ability exists, then now we just need the will and the construct and the proper governance to kind of um, ensure um, that uh, that we're verifying, you know, one user per identity. And even if that identity is anonymous, it's no big deal. Um, certain platforms will have anonymous identities like Reddit and others, and certain platforms it's more open like Facebook and, and, and Twitter. Um, but uh, But at some point, you know, we got to kind of fix that problem. <laughs> yeah. So the, the the idea there is that for a given platform, you know, I should be able to only really have one identity on that platform, not a, a multi multitude of identities. Is that is that right? Is that where you're um, headed? I mean, pretty much. You know, potentially like maybe a a business persona and a uh, um, and a um, a personal persona, right? Mm -hmm. If 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 that platform is open for that, Twitter is used for both, as an example. Facebook is used for both, so um, you could have two personas: one for you know business persona and one uh, personal. Uh, and then uh, you know LinkedIn is a business uh, professional construct, and they do a very good job in controlling personas. Uh, and there you would have only one, right? Um, so um, th that's just kind of like at a high level um, what the uh, what the proposal is. Yeah, and I, I'm just thinking through the impact there. You know, if I have, because we have these these identity providers. You know, over the last uh, you know uh, five plus years, we've seen a um, uh, growth in um, the social media and you know other providers becoming an identity provider. So that's you know Google, Facebook, Apple. You have that sign in with uh, kind of approach uh, for authentication. Um, do they have to do they continue in this this scenario do they continue to be the identity providers is it their job to validate that there's a real person behind those identities or do you imagine a different type of governance be, being involved um i think i think that's fine uh that would be that would be fine um as long as um it's done consistently across platforms right um and i do tell you that the platform that can figure that out first um would be um, would be a major winner um, because then you know that your conversations online are authentic, that you are mm. talking to a real person, um, whether um, it's their business persona or um, or a personal persona, right? So um, I, I do think that it's gonna that that's gonna improve the conversation online um, and um, and and make people more accountable um, to what they say, uh, what they propose. I think you're gonna see a reduction in quote unquote fake news. It's, you're gonna see a reduction in um, um, in um, incendiary you know rhetoric out there because people are gonna be accountable and 
um, and um, and uh, uh, you know you're going to know that uh, effectively either who you're talking to or whether that person is a real person and they've just crossed the line and yeah. and abused and abused the uh, um, the rules that are set by the platform um, and therefore they could never you know be able to get back on that platform right yeah 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 I mean if we take an example I see how that works where you have a platform where you know, it's also the platform is also the, the identity provider. Twitter is a reasonable example of that. But where you have an identity provider like Google or Apple, where their goal is to provide that identity service across multiple platforms, uh, that seems like a harder problem to solve because they're not they're not the ones with the the platform in that case. Uh, you know, Google Plus is no more. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, how would how would it work if I think Apple probably, because Apple has a real economic relationship with all of their users, I think they really care that there's a real person behind those those identities, um, I imagine. Google has less of that economic relationship, um, but still has one in many cases. I, I have a hard time imagining how it's to Google's advantage, for example, to validate that every user only has one identity. Um, so when you talk about them being a winner, how does that work for the the identity provider, or how do you imagine that working? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm ne not necessarily um, suggesting for Google to step in, but for the platform, uh, for the platforms themselves, right? Oh, uh, I to see. essentially um, um, create a um, a limit on the number of personas that you can have online, right? And then you know tie it to some other means, right? Dual factor um, um, authentication where. You're actually verifying that, hey, yeah. look, you know, you, I've tied it to a phone number, I've tied it to an IP address, I've tied it to, you know, two of these factors, you know, uh, to make sure that this person is not abusing that privilege. Yeah. So, do you see the adoption of of multi-factor authentication as a as a ultimately a, a a way to to drive this this um this type of solution? I mean, that absolutely, um, and uh, that should be definitely a a push. Uh, you know, for all of us in yeah. um, in the cybersecurity world, right? Um, this is a must for corporate IT. It's a must in um, in um, in our consumer kind of oriented communication online. Um, and um, and um, it, you know, anybody that doesn't have a strategy to implement yeah. that is is uh, is probably at a very big disadvantage nowadays with all the cybersecurity threats out there. Well, I think I think so far we've seen seen identity providers both both corporate and well maybe corporate's a, a separate example here identity providers who support and encourage multi-factor authentication but don't require it because requiring it's going to cut off a section of their users on the corporate side of course you know it's easy to require it because you're you're generally speaking an employee so it's you know you got to use the tool that's there do you think what do you think creates the tipping point for a um, a consumer identity provider to shift from Please use multi-factor to you have to use it or you don't get access to the platform. I mean, look, I 100% agree that this is where we're going to end up going um, because uh, of the uh, security threats. You know, um, their identity gets stolen. Um, mm -hmm. Many of these platforms have uh, liability because they may have credit cards sto uh, stored for that uh, for that individual, mm -hmm. and if. Um, it could be a carrot and a stick and say, hey, look, um, you know, um, we're not going to indemnify you if your <laughs> um, identity gets stolen um, unless you have dual factor authentication just to kind of drive the acceptance there. Um, but, uh, um, but you know, we really need to kind of get to some point where we're correlating um, public identities to, to, to a human being. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. I want to go back to something that we mentioned earlier and just make sure we cover it, because you mentioned that there's there's nothing wrong with anonymity but that we need to tie the the identity, the online identity to a real person. 
Um, can we talk a little bit about that? What, why is, why is being anonymous online something that that's that's acceptable or necessary? Yeah, you know, um, in the case of Reddit, I mean, you know, that's uh, you know, people kind of just go there and um, uh, build these communities. Uh, they want to remain anonymous. There's a lot of, uh, I would say. Uh, in depth, sometimes stuff that, you know, they, you know, people say there that they don't want to, um, be directly tied to. Um, there's the cases of whistleblowers, I think, where, mm-hmm. you know, we got to protect that, uh, you know, for, for people to be, um, um, essentially able to do that. Um, so, um, there's a culture of free speech, um, at least in the, in the Western world, and especially in the United States, uh, that is protected. Um, and protected from retribution that I think we need to kind of also, um, be able to, um, um, to protect. So I think that is, that, that's, um, that's an important aspect of protecting, yeah. you know, uh, uh, the anonymity of the, of the user. But, you know, we just don't want one user to have, you know, um, 20,000 personas, like in the case of some of these bots that are, uh, that drive the likes and drive the traffic and, uh, so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. I had we had a previous podcast uh, guest where we we talked a little bit about um, about victims of domestic abuse and uh, a little bit about online identities and how to help how to manage them in those situations. I think that's another example where you know someone might need to actually ensure that they're anonymous and also potentially to change their identity so that they're they're not able to be found with their their previous identity. So I think there there are definitely use cases there where anonymity is important. Um, and that, but that ability to tie back to a real person, it, it seems on the surface, it seems like that's a, a, a sizable challenge to ensure that people can be both anonymous, but also make sure those identities are tied back to an actual person rather than, um, you know, a, a specific person as opposed to one person having, you know, 15, 20, a thousand different identities. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, that's, that's also, you know, kind of correlates to the problem we have in corporate IT, right? Um, where, uh, many corporate IT departments have all these dormant uh, computers in their networks that, you know, don't even know they exist or uh, devices or um, whatnot. So, you know, that's kind of like the flip side mm-hmm. of that in corporate IT where, um, where we have a bunch of unauthenticated um, unknown machines on our networks and um, it takes a real act of discovery um, to kind of unmask them <laughs> when they're sitting on, on yeah. our network, right? So, Well, and we've got to assume that outside of corporate IT, we'll call it, you know, consumer, consumer IT, there's, there, there are, you know, thousands, millions, billions of, of abandoned identities that are, haven't been used, that aren't being used, but provide targets for, for attackers in some way. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a major risk factor out there. Um, agreed a hundred percent. Yeah. That's interesting to consider for sure. So is there a, is there a role for government oversight, do you think in in solving this problem, or is it is it really a a problem for industry to solve on its own? I'd like to see industry solve it on its own. Um, and that, take that a, wasn't a yes or a no. Yeah, <laughs> that was a I'd like. Yeah, <laughs> uh, for sure. I mean, that would be my um, my you know anytime you know. I mean, the the problem with with government, with all due respect, is that. Um, they don't necessarily know what is possible, what industry is capable of. So I do think that we've reached kind of a tipping point um, where this problem has become big enough. The issue, though, is that some of the social media players out there, um, you know, benefit from this by this frenzy. But I do tell you that that is short short sighted because um, people have uncovered that some of these discussions are. I mean, all you have to do is go on some of the Reddit forums and, you know, all the complaints is about the bots that are, um, you know, shaping the traffic on uh, some of these investment uh, um, uh, subreddits, right? And, uh, you know, so people are very conscious. So um, so they either, you know, kind of essentially move away from Reddit to some Discord service uh, where, um, where, you know, they're having kind of a little bit more real-time, authentic conversations, right? Mm-hmm. Um where it's harder for a bot to kind of be in a Discord server, right? Because you know it's, it's live conversation. It's not um, somebody that's posting and and you know leaving or uh, starting a thread or just a bunch of likes or upvotes that come in all of a sudden. Um, um, so so we just have to be careful 
that, um, you know, some of these platforms like Reddit and Twitter and Facebook and others, you know, are not looking in the rear view mirror and saying, well, you know, I'm kind of benefiting financially from this. Why should yeah. I change? Um, because I do think that people will find alternate platforms that are more authentic. Well, so ultimately, I mean, I, I think your your argument or your opinion there is that, that you know, long term, there's the, the economic win for these platforms is in dealing with this problem. Um, because ultimately, people will leave those platforms if they aren't sufficiently authentic. Is that is that a reasonable interpretation of what you're saying there? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. But for the for the time being, we have to acknowledge that the, these platforms benefit from from the 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 massive explosion of of inauthentic identities, um, and in some cases, from the money that just flows in from those inauthentic identities. If they can, if someone can spend money to shape traffic that way. That money is at least in part flowing into some of those platforms, and that, to me, that that seems like where there's an opportunity potentially for a, a legislative intervention in controlling some of that that money or that flow of money. Um, and I'll, I'll admit I haven't thought through that problem in detail, and I'm sure there are people who who definitely have. Uh, but it seems like there might be a role to play there. Definitely. I mean, I think I think at some point, um, I mean, if industry doesn't get its act together. Um, um, I mean, this is a matter of national security at some point, right? Especially mm -hmm, when what we saw in the elections. I mean, this is not a, this is not something that is just an economic, uh, economic issue. Um, and, um, um, so it is a matter of national security. The other piece in this is that, um, there are, uh, verified, uh, cyber, cyber criminals, um, associated with terrorist organizations and foreign groups. Um, that are actually trying to manipulate the market this way. So um, sooner or later, unless industry figures it out, government is going to step in 100%. Um, I mean, I think I think you were asking me about what my wish is. Is my wish is for us to kind of you know get together as adults and figure it out before government steps in, right? Uh, um, yeah. So, but uh, but if that doesn't happen, certainly uh, governmental authorities will step in. Yeah. And there it's 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 a really interesting challenge. This idea that, you know, if industry doesn't sol solve a problem, government will step in and government usually steps in with a, a fairly blunt tool as opposed to a, a nuanced approach. Um, this is, of course, not just a problem in the U.S. It's a global problem. And so, you know, we have to not just consider at what point is it such a problem that, that the U.S. government steps in. We've seen other governmental entities step in and make an impact. And, mm -hmm. and what jumps to mind for me there is, of course, the example of GDPR. GDPR. Mm -hmm. Right. Where, you know, the U.S. essentially didn't feel like uh, consumer privacy and, you know, control over consumer data was a big problem, but the EU felt it was a big enough problem. And GDPR has definitely influenced the way that, that people do business, you know, outside of the European Union, for sure. So that's an example where another government stepped in instead. Exactly. You You absolutely nailed it. And, that, yeah. and that's the point in all of this, right? Uh, is that, you know, this is a global economy. And then, um, unless we figure it out, um, uh, as, as, uh, as industry leaders, um, uh, one of those governments is going to step in and then is going to follow suit. The European Union, you know, somebody, right? Um, Canada, right? And then, um, the U.S. will, will have to react just like we do with GDPR. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. I often find with these these podcast conversations that I feel like we actually answered a bunch of questions. In this one, I, I feel like we talked a lot about a problem and came up with a lot of questions that still need to be answered. Um which is, is it's a big not problem. necessarily a, not a bad place to be, but it um, it's a little bit different than than uh, than usual in that respect. Yeah, absolutely, it's a big problem, and um, I'm you know trying to wrap my head around it from multiple aspects, right? From uh, corporate IT um, security, uh, from IoT security, right? Again, um, you know we're going into the IoT world where there's a plethora and plethora and plethora of devices. Right. Um, and, uh, potentially, um, each one of those IoT devices can actually become a threat, can become a mm. bot that is DDoSing other, other devices or other websites or other applications. So, um, 
you, you know, the, the problem is, is multiplying. And then, you know, this kind of goes into, um, a whole mentality and approach to security is that, you know, this needs to kind of be the start. You know, whenever we're developing new applications, um, such as social media, um, uh, applications, you know, we got to have security, authentic, uh, authenticity, um, um, and privacy all kind of start from the grounds up. So, you know, my, my plea is for everybody that's building new software today is to kind of start with that. Um, at the ground level, you know, at the, at the, um, at the basic level, you know, let's, let's figure that out before we kind of, um, um, go too far, um, with, uh, with developing some of the other features. I think we'll, I think we'll end with your plea there. Um, thank you so much, Emil, for, for spending time with us. It was a really interesting conversation. Um, so thank, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. And thanks to everyone who listened. Um, I hope it was, uh, Interesting, educational, created some questions for you as well as, as it did for me. Um, and uh, I hope you'll tune in for the next uh, Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.